My learning objectives include recognizing indications for tonsillectomy, listing patients at risk for persistent obstructive sleep apnea, identify methods used to evaluate sites of persistent obstruction, and discuss different treatment modalities for persistent OSA. And uh, just as important, my unwritten objective is to keep you guys from snoring and obstructing during the lecture. <laughs> Sleep-related upper airway obstruction is a spectrum of disorders starting from just habitual snoring. And by that, we mean snoring without obstruction. And that occurs in approximately 10% of kids. We see it more often when they have a cold, uh, during Houston's awesome pollen season, when their noses are always snotty, during this time of year, flu season, and that's okay. As they get better, as the allergies improve, as the cold improves, the snoring also typically improves. What we're concerned about is the kids that have sleep disordered breathing, which we know could be up to about 40% of kids that ha are obese. These are the kids that are snoring and they're also obstructing. So the parents are coming to your office and they're saying they actually have to reposition them in the middle of the night because they hear them pausing, gasping, choking, coughing during sleep. Those are all different ways that they uh, describe the kids having sleep obstruction. They're also prone to have parasomnias, sleepwalking, sleep talking, bruxism, secondary enuresis, and this fragmented sleep that they're experiencing is either causing hypersomnolence during the day, so they're having a hard time getting through a typical day of school without falling asleep, or in the younger children, it can translate to hyperactivity. If we want to quantify how much sleep obstruction these kids are having, that's when we do a sleep study. And with a sleep study, that tells us the degree of obstructive sleep apnea kids are having. And depending on the research study that you guys see, it can be up to 4% in the pediatric population. So there's a lot that we know about sleep apnea, which is why it's important to treat it, because long term it can cause cardiovascular effects such as hypertension, pulmonary hypertension, neurocognitive disorders, behavioral consequences, which is why it can affect them and their academic performance in school, um, that secondary enuresis that I talked about, and also somatic growth retardation. There's a lot of things that we're still studying, and we don't know the consequences of either sleep apnea or even persistent sleep apnea, and there's a lot of research that's been done in the adult literature that we're still trying to catch up in the pediatric world. This is data from a study that we did at Texas Children's. It was a pilot study looking at kids with sleep obstruction versus kids uh, with no sleep obstruction. And we were trying to see if the severity of their sleep apnea, which also correlated with this intermittent hypoxia that we see, affected their brain. And what we noted was the kids that had a moderate to severe obstruction, we did see different volume changes in gray matter. We don't know if it's all related to the hypoxemic effects, but we know potentially that sleep can affect and remodel different areas of the brain. So as we're trying to figure this out, we don't want to ignore sleep obstruction, we want to treat it. In 2011, the American Academy of Otolaryngology Head and Neck Surgery came up with guidelines for indications of tonsillectomy for kids. This is currently being revised, the revisions aren't put into print yet, so we're still following these specific guidelines. One of the indications for tonsillectomy that you guys are aware of is for recurrent tonsillitis. This criterion was developed um, from an article that was published in the New England Journal of Medicine by Paradise. So it's pretty common that it's also known as the Paradise criteria. And what it says is if the kids just started having tonsil infections this year, they started school and all of a sudden they're having recurrent strep, what we go by is seven episodes for that year. If it's been going on for two consecutive years, then we look for five infections per year. And if it's been going on for three consecutive years, we look at three infections per year. And I just want to mention, per the guidelines, that each episode does not have to be positive for strep. So if you look at the second section, what they clinically um, identify as an episode is sore throat as long with either temperature greater than 109, cervical adenopathy, tonsillar exudate, and or a positive strep culture. So just keep that in mind when you're seeing these kids. The most common reason we do tonsillectomies are for obstructive sleep apnea. 
and we know that there's certain kids that are at risk when we put them under anesthesia for the surgery. So there's a subset of children that we recognize that need a sleep study before they go through a general anesthetic. And uh, this population includes when we don't know if surgery is indicated. So certainly when you see a kid in the office that has very big tonsils, it's impressive. We expect that they, when they fall asleep, they go into that REM sleep, everything collapses, they're gonna have even less room to breathe around. But the parent could be telling you they sleep fine. I, don't, I only hear them snore every so often, the teachers aren't complaining. So if we don't know if the kid is obstructing or not, they need a sleep study. And the opposite is also true. You have a kid that comes to your office that looks like this. Very small tonsils, you wouldn't expect them to be obstructing, but the parent's saying they're having a lot of behavioral problems in school. Um, they're falling behind, they're tossing, turning, waking up in the middle of the night. Those kids also need a sleep study because there could be a central component, there could be hypotonia associated with it, they're actually at more risk of having moderate to severe sleep obstruction. So those kids we want to know ahead of time and get a baseline before we take them to surgery to see what other areas they may be obstructing from. Very young kids, less than two years of age, we consider getting sleep studies because they're at high risk for surgery, especially with the anesthetic guidelines of trying to prevent elective surgeries under children of two years of age. Um, syndromic kids, including trisomy 21, the American Academy of Pediatric recommends all Down syndrome kids to consider getting a baseline sleep study at four years of age. Uh, kids with neuromuscular problems, including CP, because they tend to be at higher risk when we put them under anesthesia, and kids that are obese. So any child you see on the growth chart, there it's at their 95th percentile or above on the growth curve, recommend getting a sleep study. There's different ways of grading sleep severity. In, in cl most clinical practitioners, as well as in research, we use the AHI grading system. And what the index correlates it with is, if it's less than one, we consider that as no OSA. One to five is mild, five to 10 is moderate, and greater than 10 is considered severe sleep apnea. And again, the moderate to severe are the kids that we're really concerned about. An abnormal sleep study in a child is considered um, if the pulse oximetry levels fall below 92%. I will mention with the caveat for an extended period of time. Also, if the HI is greater than one is considered abnormal and when we look at them, greater than five may warrant a tonsillectomy. So why don't we get sleep studies on all kids? Well, first of all, it's availability. Second of all is I've yet to meet the kid that looks like this. Most of them don't sleep very comfortably with, and you can imagine, I don't think any adult would either with all the electrodes on it. Most of the parents come back and say they have more of experience like this. I mean, and look, even Dora's not having a good time. <laughs> so we, we really try to be selective of who we pick to get sleep studies on. So once we uh, get the sleep study information and the kid we know either has sleep apnea or has sleep disorder breathing without the sleep study, uh, tonsillectomy and anodectomy remains the first line treatment for these kids if they're known to have adenotonsillar hypertrophy. And I added this slide because, you know, this is very easy to see in your office. The aneroids sometimes can be a bit of a mystery, right, of how big they are or where they sit. So uh, what we're looking at is behind the nose, so we're taking the scope from the front of the nose and passing it all the way in the back, that's where we see the aneroids. And these adenoids are very large, taking up about 80, obstructing about 80% of the nasal pharynx. So this is a case where we would consider taking the adenoids out. There are other indications for tonsillectomy. So if you have a child with recurrent strep or recurrent tonsillitis that hasn't met that minimum criteria goal, but they're known to have multiple reactions to antibiotics, or they don't tolerate antibiotics well, we would consider doing a tonsillectomy on that child. Kids with PFAPA, it has been advocated that it is helpful for them, and then the PFAPA, again, is the periodic fever, stomatitis, pharyngitis, along with the adenitis. Uh, history of paratonsillar abscess, because especially in the pre-adolescent, adolescent population, those kids are prone to get another paratonsillar abscess. We consider taking them out. PANDAS is more uh, equivocal mainly because we're still learning about it. There's not much research out there. The estimated studies show about a quarter of the percent of kids uh, improve with it. 
And other uh, poorly validated indications include halitosis, febrile seizures, and malocclusion of the teeth. This is what it looks like after tonsil surgery. When parents come to me in the office and I find somebody that needs the surgery, I always tell them, I expect that they will have throat pain. And I specifically say throat pain because I expect it's going to be worse than a regular sore throat. And so my job is to get them through it with minimal pain. But they're still going to surgery. They're still going to be uncomfortable during that healing period. And what we expect is, you know, day one, they have a lot of uvular edema. You can see this fibrin clot is starting to have uh, to form. They have some soft palatal edema. Their tongue could be swollen because we use a retractor to push down on the tongue during surgery. And we try to give them breaks, but despite our effort, they can get that venous congestion on the tongue. Uh, by day five, you can see a very robust eschar or fibrin pot, and typically what happens, they're more uncomfortable between the third and fourth day, and then that the clot develops, they have less discomfort until day seven. In day seven, about seven, ten days after surgery, that's when we expect the clot will start to come off, and they actually will feel that and have more discomfort again. Two weeks after surgery, we expect them to be back to their normal state, all the swelling is gone, and we see complete renal socialization. So the key of these kids really doing well after surgery is hydration. The kids that you see that are drooling are not swallowing their saliva and their pain is not controlled, and they need to call us. So what about the kids after adenocontinuity? There's been two recent meta-analysis looking at persistent OSA. The first one was published in 2006, included 14 studies over 300 subjects, and what they noted was there was about an 82% success rate. Mind you, they were targeting kids that were not syndromic, where we would expect more persistent OSA, and they excluded kids that were more really obese. The follow-up study was published in 2009, doubled the number of studies at over 1,000 subjects, and what they found was that the success rate after adenotonsillectomy was 66%. Part of the discrepancy is because they did include kids that were obese, and we know that is a risk factor for them to continue to have obstruction. So depending on the study that you see, um, up to 40, about up to 40% of kids can continue to have sleep obstruction after tonsillectomy. All those studies excluded the genetic kids, the kids with neuromuscular disorders, um, the kids that have mandibular anomalies. Those kids are all at risk. Obesity is the, one, the most common risk factor, again, of having persistent OSA after they, we take their tonsils out. Um, interestingly, kids that are asthmatic, that are non-obese, are at risk of having persistent OSA. And in children that we do get sleep studies before surgery that have severe OSA, again, that AHI greater than 10, are at risk of continuing to have obstruction after tonsillectomy. So if you see a child after tonsillectomy the, uh, that has these risk factors, that I make a bigger deal asking parents to make sure that they're not obstructing, um, continuing to be symptomatic after we take the tonsils out. The sleep study, if we do it over again and shows persistent obstruction, will tell me the degree of the obstruction that exists. And again, from various research and, and clinically, we know that there's main anatomical areas where the obstruction can occur. There's two modalities that we look to identify the, where the kid may still be obstructing. One is a specific type of MRI that's called a CINE MRI. A CINE MRI, we use light sedation and the child is still breathing and we're able to see those anatomical sites of obstruction in the axial, sagittal, and coronal planes. Uh, to be honest, the, you still need to sedate the kid uh, to do a CINE MRI, so uh, there's a lot of research on this, but clinically, the more common modality that we use is something called drug-induced sleep endoscopy, or DICE. It's, uh, 
To do it, we use the same flexible scope that we use in the office for several other things that we're looking at. It's a flexible scope that goes through the nose, again, all the way down to evaluate the full anatomy. The difference is, again, we're sedating them so I get a picture of where the child is obstructing when he's sleeping. If I do it with them awake, it gives me, um, it gives me an estimate of how they're doing, but in the office, again, it's age dependent and dependent on how well the child tolerates it. So my preference for kids that come to see me with persistent sleep apnea is to do it with them sedated. And that way I get a full evaluation of the airway, not only the upper airway, but then I also do a direct laryngoscopy to make sure I'm not missing something in the lower airway, such as a laryngeal cleft, anything in the trachea or the bronchi. This is just another slide denoting the uh, anatomical sites where we typically see persistent obstruction and the, when some of the more common surgical procedures that we can offer the kids. This is what I look for when I'm doing that DICE exam under anesthesia. So starting with the front of the nose, I look to see if the septum is deviated. Turbinates are structures that help humidify and moisture the air, and they do go all the way back to the nasal pharynx. And so if you see very big turbinates in the front, they could also be inflamed in the back, causing obstruction. At the level of the soft palate, you can have a sloping palate. At the level of the base of tongue, we see a third set of tonsil called lingual tonsils, which are not easily seen in the office, but they can be very large. And at the uh, level of the larynx, what I look for is laryngomalacia. It's the same type of laryngomalacia we see in infants, meaning it causes obstruction. We see collapse of the retinoids going into the glottis as the kid is breathing. They can have shortened aeroepiglottic folds. The difference is at baseline, there's no associated strider. So the only way we see this, again, is under anesthesia when I'm watching them breathe and as they're obstructing, the retinoids are collapsing in. But it's treated uh, in a similar fashion as uh, infant uh, laryngeal malacia by doing a cerebroglottoplasty. So I have a couple of examples to go over with you guys. The first child is a four-year-old with a history of charge at Golden Harm. Uh, he had his tonsils taken out at two years of age. The parent was concerned he was having increased behavioral problems, increased sleep problems, had a recent sleep study that just showed mild OSA. But I always ask the parent, how did the sleep study go? Because sometimes they're sleeping with the parent, which is not typical of how they're sleeping at home. And the parent will say they actually had a better night, but they're still sleeping miserably at home. And so that is important. I always say the sleep study is one tool that we use in the decision making, but it's not the only tool that we use. And so because this parent was concerned that the child had worse obstruction that was noted on the sleep study, um, along with having allergic rhinitis and already being on medical treatment for it, and having a history of recurrent bronchitis, we elected to go ahead and do a sleep endoscopy. And this is the video. And so this is starting at the level of the adenoids that have grown back. And you can see he just has thick mucus that you couldn't see from the front of the nose that's having a hard time draining. Um, and as he's sleeping, those are the kids where it's intermittently draining and causing coughing. This is with jaw thrust, and you already can see how hypotonic the, the tissue is around it causing obstruction. He has this cobblestone tissue circumferentially partly from having lingual tonsils that are starting to grow and partly from chronic irritation of tissue in the posterior pharynx. And at the level of the larynx, we see, even though he's four years old, he has that classic omega epiglottis, and you can see the serotonoid being pulled in as he's breathing, causing obstruction at the level of the glottis. And so what do I do with this information? I always give the parents a choice. It can either be a diagnostic study or it can be a therapeutic study. Given the choice, I would say the majority of the parents elect to do a therapeutic dice, meaning that if there's something I can see and correct within two hours of them being done under general anesthesia, I do it at the same time. And I go over with the parents beforehand if they have any, um, any concerns. These particular parents did have concerns because this child, when he underwent his initial 
tonsillectomy surgery, didn't do well, had prolonged recovery. And so they weren't excited about going through this similar type of recovery doing the lingual tonsils. And because we were more concerned about the recurrent bronchitis and potentially that mucus that was having a hard time passing through the nose causing um, infections from the upper airway to the lower airway, we elected to deal with the nasal component first. So I started off with doing an adenoid revision, a turbinant reduction, as well as a strupoglottoplasty. The other thing that I noticed with this kid, which I check on all my syndromic kids, is that he had a laryngeal cleft. And that could also be contributing to his recurrent bronchitis. And so uh, we talked about with the parent him potentially coming back and doing an injection in this area. To, and after I inject it, um, I typically have them do another swallow study to see if they improve, if we notice subjectively notice less infections um, and they notice an improvement in their swallowing. And then we can go back and permanently surgically correct this. And so future considerations would be the lingual tonsil removal as well as the laryngeal cleft. It's multi-level surgery, meaning usually there's more than one thing that I'm addressing at one time, but it's impossible to address all of it at the same time. So you have to be thoughtful of what areas you address first, depending on what I perceive is causing the worst obstruction for that child at that time. The second example is one of my tickable patients. This is a 12-year-old with trisomy 21, had not had any sleep studies, came to see me. The parents didn't think that there was a problem, had never had any surgery. We got a baseline sleep study that showed that the child had severe obstructive sleep apnea with associated hypoxia. The oxygenator was 82%. And you can see even um, the AHI was 31, and this is the case for the majority of the kids that they will have more hypopneas so even though it's not a complete apnea, hypopneas are still important. Also had a history of recurrent pneumonias. And this is what I noticed on this kid's dice. So this is clinically what I saw in the office, that you can see the tonsils are not very big, which is not typical for Down syndrome kids, but this is why we look, because kids aren't typical. You know they surprise us every day. Uh, what was typical when I did the endoscopy exam is he had very large adenoids, completely including his nasopharynx. Beyond the adenoids, this is a view at the level of the soft palate or the velum. What I noted was these are actually lingual tonsils pushing up against his epiglottis, and you can see pushing it in the posterior wall. This is a view without using jaw thrust. The child is completely obstructing. When I induce jaw thrust, you can see it pushes those muscles out of the way, and now I can get a view of the superglottis super as well as the glottis. This is another view of those lingual tonsils at the level of the base of the tongue. Um, this is the view of shortened AE folds, and this is why I actually look beyond the, um, the glottis, noted to have an accessory bronchus or pig bronchus uh, that's uh, above the level of the, uh, the right main stem. And this is what it looks like after I take the lingual tonsils out. They develop a similar scab, a similar eschard that we get for a regular tonsillectomy, and it generally takes about the same amount of time for them to heal. There are non-surgical options, and in kids that have persistent severe obstructions, it usually is um, a combination of surgery and non-surgery to adequately sleep, treat the sleep obstruction. So CPAP um, is usually indicated, also indicated on these kids. A lot of them, um, we do see that they have increased BMI, and I always tell parents it's a gradual process to lose the weight. We now have a nutritionist that works with me in my comp complex sleep clinic as well as my trisomy 21 clinic, so they are available to see them in the office. Certain medications have also been noted to be helpful in kids with persistent sleep obstruction, including intranasal cortical steroid sprays and leukotriene inhibitors. If you put them on Singular, just play, make sure that you, ironically, you tell the parent in about 1% of the kids it can cause behavioral problems and it can cause nightmare sleep disturbance. These are my key points and uh, secondary to the essence of time, I'm gonna skip over them because you have them in front of you because I wanna end off by just mentioning a new service that we're doing at West Campus called Single Visit Surgery. This was something that was started in 2016 in, uh, with pediatric surgery as well as plastics department and we're piloting this for ENT. 
We are looking for kids uh, with recurrent ear infections where you feel they're at the point they, they need tubes that would benefit from tubes. We are doing it twice a month on Fridays by myself as well as Dr. Rayner. We review the chart, we see if they qualify, they come into the office that morning. If we agree that they would benefit from tubes, they go down, register, and we put the tubes in the same day. They're able to be discharged within two to three hours of being there. Um, if you have patients that are interested in this, just give us a call. This is the number of our surgery scheduler at West Campus, Lubna, 832-227-1034. Thank you for your time.